Well, hello, it's Anne here, and we're back in Platt Fields, this time at the beginning of August, so at the height of summer. And we're expecting to see everything looking very blousy at this stage, a little bit overgrown, possibly. Um, but what we will be seeing, which is quite unusual and a testament to the hot summer that we've had, uh, are some very early fruiting berries on the both trees and in shrubs. Now first up here on the left we've got Persicaria or Bistort and this is this is a really common plant you'll, you'll see this in various forms in botanical gardens in our own private gardens highly cultivated and here in the wild. It's also known as snakeweed and pink pokers and it's related to the members of the dock family. This particular species is the common or officinalis bistort. So officinalis is, is another word that was quite often used to denote that something had uses uh, medicinally in the past. I think pink pokers is probably the most appropriate name so because you can see the little flowers at the end of a stalk, so only one stalk um, usually, and then the, the leaves are lancelot shaped and they are the bits that are used. So bistort traditionally was a wound healing herb. So what was what was done was, as with a couple of others that we'll see today, is it's chopped up or chewed in the mouth if you're out in the field and, and you're indulging in bushcraft. And then the spit is used to bind it together and then it's applied to a wound. And the idea is it will help heal very quickly. And here we are with another little clump of uh, bistort. But what I like about this is that we can just see the um, brambles or blackberries coming on the right, just next to it here. And most of the moment are red, but obviously we, we are sort of starting to see them fully ripe as well. So keep an eye out for them. And here we've got a lovely example great willow herb and we'll also be seeing broadleafed willow herb so the difference being that obviously broadleaf is much more oval shaped um, but they both the great and the broadleaf have got this branching structure to to the plant as opposed to the rose bay willow herb which you'll probably be very familiar with now because it's really um dressing up most verges along roadsides and it's obviously the, the single stem spire of the, the purple flowers as opposed to the branching types which have got the um, flatter petals in dotted about the whole plant. What's nice here though is that we're actually seeing the willow leaf as well on the, on the tree. So this is what's giving the plant the name and you can immediately see the similarities between the leaf shape. Now just peeping out down here next to these much riper brambles, we've got a, a smaller version of the or species of the willow herb family. And based on the sort of habitat round and about, this possibly could be the marsh uh, willow herb. We know it's a willow herb because, again, the shape of the leaves. And also, you'll notice with the willow herbs that they have these long, elongated seed pods. They're actually fruit capsules which release the seeds all in one go. Also, the mature flowers obviously are pink but they're symmetrical and the petals are often deeply split. There's another one of the willow herb family which you'll probably see as you're walking about um, around and about 
pavements and the base of walls and that tends to have a much more delicate flower sometimes slightly striped and that could possibly be something called chickweed willow herb now we've been seeing um, a couple of examples of rowan trees or mountain ash with the red berries already but here we've got something really quite exciting which is the common ash tree and I say exciting because what we're actually looking at here are the fruits of the ash tree. They're actually called ash keys and as you can see they sort of hang in very dense clusters on the tree itself and they will actually stay here pretty much um, over the winter so in fact you can use them as a bit of a marker um, during the winter landscape uh, in order to identify the trees themselves once the leaves have gone. The ash keys are collectively known as a samsara. As I say, most of them will, will remain steadfastly and cling on. Now, Maud Grieve wrote or writes in her modern herbal book that the keys are actually more active medicinally than the leaves and the barks of the ash tree. Apparently, medieval physicians regularly used them as a remedy for digestive discomfort. I wonder if it's because they were so readily available um, and have a relatively long shelf life. So, you know, wherever they were, they could pretty much um, rely upon a, a good supply of ash keys because they don't have to be harvested um, when they're young or anything like that. In more recent times, I think the ash keys have become quite popular amongst foragers, um, preserved with salt and vin vinegar combinations, and they're supposed to taste a bit like a sort of caper. So here, just crouching down beside the um, railings, we've got yarrow or Achillea milfolium, sometimes known as staunch weed and also as nosebleed. And that should give you a little bit of an idea of what, what we're going to use this plant for. As the colloquial name nosebleed implies, it was traditionally used to stop nosebleeds. But conversely, if you don't have a nosebleed and you put a rolled up um, yarrow leaf up your nose, then you will get a nosebleed. I haven't tried that, but I have tried um, when I've cut my finger before, funnily enough, when gardening, I have wrapped the leaf of Achillea round it and it does stop the blood flow. Um, it's because it's got very, it's got lots of high concentration of tannins and that acts as an astringent. The other thing is that despite the fact it looks really delicate, certainly in this particular video, um, it's incredibly tough. You can't just pull a yarrow leaf off the stem it's well it's very hard they're really really sinewy and tough so you generally speaking have to cut them off you can also eat the leaves they're very bitter but some people do pop them into um, a green salad to have before a meal so very good for the digestive system um, because they encourage the secretion of bile so it, very good for also for the liver now here we are at the ragwort, a member of the daisy family or Asteraceae family. And in this case, it's the groundsel tribe. So this covers pretty much anything with a tuft of papus hair. So quite often you see this little white tuft around after the, the flower has gone to seed. 
The botanical name is Senecio jacobaca. And Senecio derives from Senex, which actually means the white hair of an old man. It has got some other names, stinking willy, staggerwort, stammerwort. And wart, as you remember, does actually use it, mean that it was used at some point for medicinal purposes. However, whilst it does look this lovely innocuous shade of yellow, um, very daisy-like, it is very harmful or can be very harmful to livestock. This is because it contains some pyrolizidine alkaloids and they in themselves are very toxic, particularly to horses, and they can cause severe and fatal uh, liver damage. So a bit of a bittersweet one for us today. But to finish up, we have something that's actually called bittersweet or woody nightshade. It's a member of the Solanaceae family, which is the same as potato, tomato, aubergine, and some of the really deadly nightshades, such as Atropa belladonna. But it's also the same family as Petunia, and you can see the similarities um, in many of, of the flowers. I particularly love the leaf shape here, and then the colours, the, the lovely purple petals with the yellow cones. The yellow cones are a superior ovary, so that's in front of the petals. And then as the flowers go over and turn into fruits, those fruits again you'll be familiar with. They're shiny red, sort of oval shaped um, berries and they come in lovely clusters. This particular species is Solanum dulcamara and it has a climbing habit. So you can see here it just sort of climbs its way in between other shrubs. Now this family really do have quite a few interesting members and certainly the, the nightshade elements, they contain um, a chemical called solanine which is a bitter glycol alkaloid and you may be aware of sometimes when you're peeling potato you see a bit of green tinge to the skin and I was always taught never to eat potatoes that were slightly green and that and that is this um, alkaloid it is poisonous but you you would need to take an awful lot of it so there's also narcotic um, nightshades that can cause psychedelic uh, hap happenings and hallucinations they were used by witches to as part of the constituents for uh, flying ointment so obviously not not to be recommended so you have to treat any member of this family with caution but this particular one is is one of the least poisonous members so that's it for today i hope you've enjoyed the walk as much as i have there's been an awful lot to see and i look forward to seeing you again next time bye for now